Have you ever wondered why pizza or ice cream can be so hard to resist? Well, today we're going to dive deep into the science behind why gluten and dairy in particular can be so addictive. And you're not going to believe this, but this stuff can break down into compounds that are incredibly addictive and that actually cause us to crave these foods and make it hard for us to stop eating them. So if you have autoimmunity or, or if you're trying to avoid these foods to improve your health, you're not going to want to miss this episode. Welcome to the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. You're now part of a growing community of people determined to take their health back through education and self-empowerment. But because of the healthcare system today, we don't have access to the types of healthcare that we want. So we have to do things differently. We've got to do things smarter, and we do that by becoming our own advocates. This podcast will give you the perspective and thoughts of one of the world's leading Hashimoto's doctors. So let's get started. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Hashimoto's Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Shook, and today we're going to be talking about something that really a lot of you have never heard about. I'm sure this was something that was new to me uh, pretty recently, and it is absolutely mind-blowing. And it's we're really going to talk about why certain foods, especially gluten and dairy, feel so addictive, and what it means for our health, and especially if you're autoimmune, what kind of uh, potential impact this may be having on your ability to remove a lot of these foods that we know tend to be immune reactive and drive autoimmune processes and why it can be so hard to you know separate yourself from them to eliminate them from your diet and really the the, the difference in you know from one person to the next because some people can stop eating gluten and they feel fine and then other people have a real challenge with it. So we're going to explain and get into why that might be a problem for you and some of the things that you can consider doing about it. Scientists have found that gluten, dairy, and processed foods can trigger addictive responses that are similar to commonly abused drugs. When I heard this, I was so bummed out because quite frankly, you know, those foods most people will agree that foods containing gluten and dairy and some processed foods taste really good. And I mean, th the thing is, is that they're not always bad for every single person, but they are, you know, typically real significant problems if you're autoimmune like me and like millions and millions of other people. And they're some of the top foods that we find need to be avoided because they trigger an immune response and they create all kinds of problems for digestive tract, health and function, and they really just tend to be some of the top drivers of autoimmune conditions. And so, you know, routinely I am asking and guiding people to remove these foods from their diet. And it, so this is, uh, this was, this explains a lot really. So what I, what I see clinically and the difficulty with removing these these particular foods from the diet, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And so what the scientists found was that the more processed the food is, the higher its addiction potential. And you, you're, you could probably guess the number one food that tops their list, and, and don't get mad at me, you know, but this is the reality of the situation. The number one food, pizza. Yeah, think about it for a second. You've got gluten, you've got cheese, you, it's, you know, it's the, the gluten is, is in a, uh, you know, it's flour, it's in a refined form. And, you know, it, it has, it has a high glycemic load. So it can, it can raise blood sugar significantly. So you get several things happening at one time. And it's really, it's really due to the combination of these things. I believe that that makes it, you know, such a significantly, um, you know, addictive, high addiction potential food. And whenever you eat something that, you know, spikes blood sugar, which is really, it, it, this is a secondary problem. This is not the primary thing we're talking about with the opiate-like compounds that we're going to discuss in a second. But when, you, when you're eating something that has, you know, gluten and dairy and it can spike blood sugar, man, that is a really powerful combination that can be problematic for some people, very problematic. And, because when you have blood sugar spikes, it, it can, you know, cause a surge in blood sugar, and then typically it's followed by a crash, which this has a really um, interesting effect on our brain. It stimulates, 
areas of the brain that are associated with cravings, and it really can cause hormonal dysregulation and drive inflammation. And this can really be a problem for people that are autoimmune and that have Hashimoto's as it can lead to uh, flares of these conditions and cause a lot of problems. Okay, so let's talk about what's actually going on here and what you can do about it. So first of all, when you're consuming gluten-containing foods, and remember gluten is primarily derived from wheat, barley, and rye, and when you're consuming casein containing foods, which is the primary protein found in cow's milk. These proteins get metabolized in your body. You have enzymes that work on them in your digestive tract that break them down into smaller pieces. Now, when these proteins are broken down into smaller pieces, those smaller pieces are called peptides, and that is a partial protein. There are a bunch of different peptides, uh, and a lot of these peptides have physiological effects. And it just so happens that when gluten is broken down, by these enzymes, one of the peptides that it forms is called gluteomorphin. And when casein, casein is broken down, one of the peptides that formed is called casomorphin. And I want you to pay close attention to the last part of that word, morphin, because it is, it is an opioid-like compound. These are called exorphins. This, when, when these things are made, they're called uh, exorphins. And that is similar to if you... If you um, it sounds similar to, if you think about it, to endorphin, right? Exorphins are similar in that, you know, endorphins are made by the body. They, they're they feel-good chemicals typically made, like we, they're commonly thought of by people when you exercise or when you're, you're happy. And they have the, the ability to stimulate our opioid receptors in the brain. Now, these are the same receptors that, you know, powerful addictive drugs like morphine uh, and prescription medications also work upon. So when you're consuming gluten and casein or glu- you know gluten containing foods or casein containing foods, dairy and prim- primarily cow's milk derived, these may have a very addictive impact on you. And this is why some people that try to eliminate these foods from their diet have such a difficult time because they literally have an addiction to the food. So this makes it, you know, a real problem for people. And if if you're, you know, like many of the people out there, millions and millions of people that have autoimmunity, removing gluten and dairy tend to be tend to be very important to at least try because they are known to be triggers and perpetuators of a lot of autoimmune conditions. And so, you know, when I work with people, those are two of the foods that we almost always do a trial elimination on and if you're addicted to them, if you're if you're stimulating, and if your body's producing the gluteomorphin and the casomorphin, and if your digestive tract is compromised, if you have what we call leaky gut, or uh, or if you look in the scientific literature, intestinal hyperintestinal permeability, then then these peptides are able to make their way into the bloodstream much easier. And then when they get in circulation, they go to the brain. And once they're in the brain, they can stimulate these opioid-like receptors. And these can these can trigger these feel-good, you know, these sensations, uh, these um, emotions of pleasure and, uh, and actually, you know, cause an addiction to these foods. And I mean, I've seen this with kids that have tried to remove these foods from their diet. Uh, They become very grumpy. They can uh, pitch tantrums and it can be really difficult, especially in the beginning. So it's really important to know that if you're having trouble eliminating gluten or dairy, it may be that you literally have an addiction because of the production of these opiate-like compounds. Now, there are some things that you can do about it, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So what can we actually do about this? And good question, and not the easiest question to answer, but I do have some tips for you. So the first thing is just being aware that these foods are addictive is the very first the first thing to acknowledge and to realize because once you realize that there is literally an opiate like compound that is made through the metabolism of gluten and casein then you can better understand why it might be harder or why you may have had difficulty or why you may have this emotional connection to gluten and dairy in the first place so that just helps you to be aware that hey it's not just 
a lack of willpower. And maybe uh, my connection is, is actually chemical. And that can give you some perspective and, and empower you. So step one is just becoming aware of this issue. The second thing is, if you're really serious about eliminating these foods, and this is typically a huge issue for people that have Hashimoto's. It, there, if there's one food, I've worked with a lot of different people that have uh, various autoimmune conditions. And especially in those that have Hashimoto's, which is obviously the most common autoimmune condition uh, that there is, gluten tends to play a very significant role. I mean, it's almost every single person that I work with, it, it tends to be a problem. So, you know, what I would say is that if you're, you know, if you're dealing with autoimmunity or if you're just trying to see if cutting out gluten or casein will improve your health, that you're going to want to put together some strategies where you determine, you know, prior to taking these things out of your diet, where you're eating them, like, like, where are you eating them in your diet? When are you eating them? You know, are you making a sandwich and taking a sandwich, you know, to work every day or whatever, you know, are you eating, are you eating, routinely eating gluten containing foods and, and casein every single day, identify where you're, where you're consuming it. And then the second thing is look for alternatives. How can I replace like a, you know, my bread with a gluten-free bread? Um, how can I replace my cheese with something else, like maybe uh, avocado? You know, look for, look at every everywhere you're consuming it and then look for alternatives and, you know, take a little bit of time to explore those alternatives and come up with, try some different things. You know, you don't have to do this all at once, but you can there are so many options available now it's it's worth can it's you know it's worth looking into but first is just being aware where and when you're consuming it the next thing that i would consider is utilizing a digestive enzyme that will help you to more thoroughly digest these these peptides because proteins you know we talked about like let's just use gluten protein for example gluten protein we use this um this analogy of like a, a chain, okay? And a chain has multiple links and the chain itself is, is, is a protein. Let's say it's gluten. And the individual links of the chain are amino acids. They are the building blocks of proteins. And when you, if you were to take an enzyme, which we, uh, we said was kind of like a pair of scissors, and if you were just to cut the chain at one link and separate the chain into two, two different smaller chains, those smaller chains are called peptides. Well, if you take enzymes, and this, this tends to be a very helpful strategy for people that I've worked with that are autoimmune. This seems to work uh, pretty well. In combination with trying to eliminate these proteins from your diet, taking enzymes when you eat can be really helpful because you're, you're, you're giving the uh, the body more digestive enzymes to help break these proteins down into the individual chain links, which are the individual amino acids, which you will not have a reaction to those, an immune response to those. Now, you will have a reaction to the peptides, but if you have sufficient digestive enzymes and digestive capacity, you can break those individual, those you, you can separate those proteins into their uh, individual amino acids. And if you can reduce the number or, uh, or, uh, you know, eliminate these peptides, these, uh, these more, um, opioid like addictive peptides, the gluteomorphin and the caseomorphin and break them down into their individual amino acids that will help to reduce your exposure to them. All right. So just more thorough digestion can be helpful. Okay. That's a, that's another thing that you can consider. One more thing to consider is your digestive tract health. So one of the most common findings that we'll see in functional medicine when working with people that are autoimmune is that their intestinal tract and their intestinal lining tends to be unhealthy. And what I mean by that is there is a degree of increased permeability. So your, your intestinal lining is a selectively permeable immune barrier system. Did you know that? It is a selectively permeable barrier. It's a, literally a barrier. It's a mucous membrane, and it is the interface between the 
outside world and the inside world. And though you might think that your intestinal tract, the inside of the, the intestine itself, that tube, you might think of that as being inside you because it is inside your body, but it's really this interface between the outside world because you ate food that goes through and it gets digested and and then it gets broken down into components that the body can use and when they're small enough they can pass through the intestinal lining selectively right it doesn't just let everything through into the bloodstream where it's carried through the circulatory system and the body uses it for the various physiological processes if this barrier system becomes compromised which you know we commonly use the term leaky or leaky gut if your mucus layers get broken down, if the barrier system becomes compromised, and if you just imagine that it has like larger holes and things can pass through it into the bloodstream, that's a pretty good way to think of it, then you're going to be able to pass these proteins and peptides through much easier into, into the bloodstream, which could trigger you know this opiate-like response and immune responses that, that could drive inflammation and drive the immune system and create all these problems. So if your intestinal lining is healthy, if you if you get your uh, intestinal uh, lining yeah, to to be in a healthy state, you uh, improve the mucus barrier because you have two layers of mucus uh, on the uh, the inside or or you know on the the intestinal uh, wall. And if if those are broken down, then you have problems. And because they serve uh, they serve a real significant purpose, they they help um, that mucus helps the the bacteria. You have mucus forming bacteria that are sometimes absent. Uh, you ha- that that can create problems with that. You have bacteria that feed on the mucus. And there's this symbiotic relationship between your in- between the bacteria in your gut and your intestinal lining. So. If you can get your intestinal bacteria and your intestinal environment healthier, then you're going to have a healthier intestinal barrier system. And that's going to keep things in the gut that need to stay in the gut and not in the bloodstream. So that's another thing that you would really want to focus on. And we utilize a lot of different strategies. Uh, You know, we'll often do testing to observe what's happening in the gut and then try to formulate a strategy around that. And... Uh, and so that can be another way to to try and you know mitigate some of these exposures to casomorphin and gluteomorphin. So hopefully those tips will give you some ideas of actionable steps and things that you can do right now to try and reduce your exposure to these addictive compounds. And then once you have this out of your diet long enough, it tends to become much easier. Like in my life now, I don't need you know, I don't have a desire to consume gluten at all. And it's been, you know, it's been really nice. I mean, there are certain social situations where, you know, it would be easier than saying, no, no, thank you. You know, I'm gluten free. Uh, It would be uh, easier to just consume the gluten. But, you know, I have uh, caved to that in the past and and I don't do that anymore. And um, I try to you know, protect myself, not put myself in those situations where I'm going to be, uh, where it's going to be awkward, but you just have to come up with, you know, some, you know, be prepared. You know, if you're going somewhere and you might be offered food or something, you just be ready to say, uh, no, thank you. You know, I really appreciate it, but you know, I, I eat gluten free. It just, it, I feel much better when I do, but I appreciate it. You know, you just be, um, you know, just be appreciative and, um, and grateful and people, you know, today are much more uh, accepting of than, than they have ever before. But uh, hopefully these tips will really help you with trying to, you know, eliminate gluten or understand this relationship, this literally, this addictive relationship and give you some strategies to uh, try to mitigate it, to get your health back and give you some other options. If you found this episode helpful, please share and leave a review. It really helps the podcast. And as always, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can also follow us on YouTube and Facebook at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. You can join our Facebook group, the Greater Hickory Thyroid Support Group with over 11,000 members. And you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Brad Shook. And remember, together, we can make a difference. Remember, 
Knowledge is power, and the more we understand our bodies and the effects of the foods that we consume, the better equipped we're going to be to make choices that support our health. So stay curious, stay informed, and always strive for better health. Until next time, take care. See you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed hanging out behind the scenes with Dr. Shook. You can also talk with and learn from Dr. Shook through Facebook Live on our Facebook page at the office of Dr. Brad Shook. Don't forget, you can also get access to our videos, guidebooks, and thyroid programs at www.drbradshook.com. Oh yeah, and don't forget one more thing. We can change the world one person, one family, and one community at a time. Until next time, remember, today is your day, and no one will tell you who you are and what you can be.